Hello, you're all very welcome to this event as part of our Poetry and Poetics reading series at the English Department in Maynooth University, Ireland. I'm Carlo Hanlon and with my colleague Dr Catherine Gander, I'm tremendously excited to welcome the award-winning poet Aishan Hutchinson, who is joining us today to read and discuss his poetry. We'd like to thank colleagues in the English Department, our Head of Department Professor Lauren Arrington for supporting this series, and Tracy O'Flaherty for working with us on this online event. I'd also like to thank my third year poetry seminar group who've been reading Aishan's work, you're very welcome. And to the poets who have joined or will join us for this series, Carolyn Forche, Philip Metres, Fanny Coppeldeo and Sean Hewitt. Recordings of our previous events are on our YouTube channel, so please do check there and our Eventbrite page for future readings. Today we'll hear Aishan Hutchinson read his poetry, including his most recent collection, House of Lords and Commons, and some new poems. A conversation between myself, Catherine and Aishan will follow, and please do ask Aishan any questions using the chat box in the second half of the event. The event will last one hour and is being recorded. Aishan Hutchinson is the author of House of Lords and Commons, published by Faber in 2016, and Far District, a stunning debut published in 2010 by the ever-excellent Peepal Tree Press in Leeds. Aishan's incredible list of accolades include winning the National Book Critics Circle Award for Poetry, a Guggenheim Fellowship, the Joseph Brodsky Rome Prize, the Whiting Writers Award, the Penn Joyce Osterweil Award, the Wyndham Campbell Prize for Poetry, and the American Academy of Arts and Letters Award in Literature. Aishan is Professor at Cornell University, where he teaches in the Graduate Writing Program. It's a real privilege to introduce a poet whose work I so deeply admire. Aishan's poetry is visionary in the best sense of the word. In his rain-lashed seascapes, his pantheon of poets, ghosts and gods, he writes the world for us. A hurricane he describes as one eye that unhooked banjos from the hills, or opening the pages the Italian poet Eugenio Montale brings, the scent of iron and light coming out of heads of lemon trees. One of the things I really like about his poetry is that it doesn't have a modern allergy to adjective, it's richly descriptive. If his formerly precise poetry provides us with vivid, sensuous ways of looking and feeling, it is also attuned to conquest, colonialism and empire. In reworking a line from St. John Peirce's epic, Anabas, Hutchinson writes, power they sing, spitting salt into flames. His poetry is never less than aware of how conquest has been sung by poet chroniclers, how, as William Hazlitt wrote, the language of poetry naturally falls into the language of power. In his lush language, the lightning strokes of his syntax, Hutchinson's poetry, to adapt one of his phrases, dismantles history. Aishin, you're very welcome. Thank you so much, Carl, for that very kind and generous introduction. And I am very grateful for the, the invitation to come to Maynooth, uh, um, well, I'm not there, uh, to read virtually. Um, it's always a little, I find it more nerve wracking to read virtually than on stage. Um, and I miss doing that and hopefully that will happen again soon and you'll re-invite me uh, to, to Ireland to read. Um, I cannot see anyone um, watching this uh, program at the moment, but uh, thanks for being here. And how this will go, I will share screen and uh, read uh, poems uh, that will be on your screen. So please follow along, or if you want, just ignore them. Bear with me while I try to get this right. Okay, <clears throat> so I am going to uh, begin with a poem called Autobiography of Snow, which uh, appeared in my first book. 
And it's a poem dedicated to and being addressed to the great uh, Jamaican born poet, Claude McKay, um, who moved to the US in his early twenties. He lived uh, a long time in, in Harlem in, in New York and is often uh, said to be one of the, the, one of the key figures in the Harlem Renaissance. Um, not a lot to, to really know about this poem, um, but I would encourage you to pick up the, uh, any, the work of uh, Claude McKay, one of the great voices that came out of uh, Jamaica. Autobiography of Snow for Claude McKay. Gray statues stand with pigeons' hearts. Children calls and cries rustle in treetops. Bare heavy women trot with heads low, white aliveness coming out of them. I come, Claude, in a warm October and watch boys at the rim of a fountain. A sun-colored ball floats past the ukulele man, past hula hoop girls twirling sunlight. The juggler spins eyeballs through double O brass rings. A child lulls in its strollers. Lovers kiss and part underneath the arch. Drizzle above the high rises. Through the streets, coats swish by. Black boots clump into a coffee shop. Nina Simone pours pastel blues. I know this. A finger of memory lifts to the waitress and to forecast the rain back home. Remember island rain, Claude? Grass and asphalt blending, the road a crucible, even the dog shit smells good, even the hot cane field. She takes the signal, brings us two steaming cups. You take off, Harlem or Russia, doesn't matter. Now is right, my status alien, to weigh my lines. Most are antique and have entered antiquity with my slow pace. In my coffee, a hurricane is brewing. I rise and tip her well. Outside the street evaporates. Lorca's dead body stalks these parks with yours I pass, my shoulders tucked neat in song, quick into the queue going underground. My mind sings tonight, tonight. I must bear my navel string in the city heavy with snow. The American fiction, bogus dreams that put us on ice. I know snow as soap opera, the comedy of white heap shoveled into strophe and anti-strophe for long blocks. Snow as envy, a shaken blanket marking a lasting echo over clean avenues. Oh, flame heart, I stay within the middle of dark passages, roads sliced into trails going nowhere, waiting for your coat to turn the corner, licked by a lamp's flame, the fire between Christ's palms. Back in the apartment's hole, I bury my hands in this frigid craft and tremble, McKay, Huskin, away home. <clears throat> um, we we'll move from that poem to one called Sibelius and Marley, two figures that I'm sure uh, we all know very well. Um, Jean Sibelius, 
the Finnish composer and Bob Marley, the great composer of Jamaican music. Um, I, I think of them and wanted to put them in this kind of conversation, in this poem, because I think of their music as um, anchoring uh, the spirit of a nation struggling against um, history and the atrocity of history. Sibelius and Marley. History is dismantled music, slant, bleak on gravel. One amasses silence. Another chastises silence with nettles, stinging ferns. I oscillate in their jaws. The whole gut listens. The air winces white nights in his talons, sinking mare. He wails and a comet impales the sky with the dual wink of a wasp burning. Music dismantles history. The flambeau inflamed in his eyes with a locust plague. A rough gauze bolting up his mouth unfolds. So he lashes the air with ropes and roots that converge on a dreadful zero, a golden age. Somewhere, an old film, dusk soldiers on a cold, barren coast. There, I am a cenotaph of horns and stones. And another poem called The Difference. The Difference. They talk oil in heavy jackets and plaid over their coffee. They talk Texas and the North Coal, but mostly oil and Obama. Voices dipping, vexed, and they talk Egypt failing, Greek broken, and it takes cash for France, not charity. And I rather speak Russia than Ukraine, one says in rubles, than whatever, whatever the trouble, because there is sea and gold, a tunnel, wherever right now, and anyhow, Belarus. Oh, I will show you something conspiring coins, this one, China, and they marvel. Their minds hatched crosses, a frontier zeroed not by voyage or pipeline, nor the milk foam of God. No, not the gutsy whether they talk, frizzled, the abomination worsening, opulence to squalor, never the inverse. Sprawl. Amid ice and granite, sea hush and crash, and the profit and the loss, the profit Xerox in his tamarind shade, and wasp buzz and saw in the hills crash leaves and virgin suicides right after the election and November's Janus, and Pontius Pilate's maggot snipers, amen. And fortunately, I forgot to be afraid and kept my fear in the salt, chiseling my face when I read Keats and loved the ash and put two coins in my right palms amid the crash crop Century of wheat, drought, rosary, terracotta, Kali reconnaissance, renaissance, my nipples, torpedoed and rock the strobe lit stage show. The gorgons scintillated romance foiled the constable's peace. And Herodotus slept 
as the prophet rose to his chalice and put on his mongrel pelt and it rained softly and blessed nothing scarce of breath and grated nutmeg and the tyranny of sugar and pure cream soda enclosed in cinders shook, burst, fizzed and I found my shape shifted, ciphered, raw, my total reversal, my total reversal, my total reversal. Um, now I will read um, two new poems. The first one of which is called Little Music. Little music. What a lot of little music can do. The blind farmer daylights in his cabbage row, going crouch down between leafy skulls nose. He rises indifferent, far gazing as a fine haze disfigures the mountain. A lot of little music can do that. Aunt May opens her oven and Egypt comes to town. She closes it and sorrow fills the coals for she refuses to sing, oh, Jerusalem, but would rather say justice and devotion are my riches, which her grandson says to the exorers, naturally stroking their small bonfires. Madmen proliferate in the town square. They speak to themselves a shattered civil constitution, more music than music, cracked parchment voices like high tensile fencing around the courthouse. Wandering mummies, they had foreseen the past, screech owls and ruins, tourist only beaches, local natives leaving no footprints on the sand of time. That is what a lot of little music does. Rosemary, self-wounding rose, stabs boy blue for dreaming of frost and the iron bird. Boy blue stabs rose back and marries her twin. All things considered, he is not a dog. All things not considered, he is a dog. Ashabanipal stammering from yard to yard with vials of ointment and powder to cure body come downness and bad mind. Himself a market of fraught in spirits, the seventh angel for whom there is no cure. Nighthawk, through his burden of wisteria, eyes caution signs outside roof nightclub, warns the microchip in Revelation 13 verse 16 will be grafted in all flesh. I dreadlocks in moonlight shall not wither like ball heads at sunrise in Midian. Nighthawk, meteors away. The rest hides in smoke. Sundays baked quiet. It is done so soft like rain on the moon, like curtains parting and the moon is there or else the sun is there, full of a lot of little music. That is the sea, there, always amethyst and slightly drunk, like the fishmen on shore, who, in near silence, look across the bay at the swamp heavy with scarlet ibises, where, alone, Krekre lives, a king, having fastened to his head a bob wire crown. He lifts his conch horn and blows out the stars. It can be vicious, and it is vicious to make such renunciation, 
such rough music, a lot of it disposable, yet non-dispensable, rocking every night. The next poem is not my own. Um, I'll read uh, mine after it, but because it's the poem that inspired uh, my own poem, I thought it only fair that I should read it. Uh, it's fairly well known, one by one of uh, Shakespeare's contemporary, uh, Thomas Nash, and it's called A Litany in a Time of Plague. A litany in a time of plague. Well, it's, I say it's called that, but that's the title given to it by anthologists. Um, it wasn't called anything. Uh, it was just a lyric that was appended to one of Nash's own play. A very fine lyric. I do farewell earth's bliss. This world uncertain is. Thunder life's lustful joys. Death proves them all but toys. None from his darts can fly. I am sick. I must die. Lord, have mercy on us. Rich men, trust not in wealth. Gold cannot buy you health. Physic himself must fade. All things to end are made. The plague Full swift goes by. I am sick. I must die. Lord, have mercy on us. Beauty is but a flower which wrinkles will devour. Brightness falls from the air. Queens have died young and fair. Dust hath closed. Helen's eye. I am sick. I must die. Lord, have mercy on us. Strength stoops unto the grave. Worms feed on Hector brave. Swords may not fight with fate. Earth still holds open her gate. Come, come, the bells do cry. I am sick, I must die. Lord, have mercy on us. Wit with his wantonness tasted death's bitterness. Hell's executioner hath no ear for to hear. What vain art can reply? I am sick, I must die. Lord, have mercy on us. Haste, therefore, each degree to welcome destiny. Heaven is our heritage. Earth, but a player's stage. Mount we unto the sky. I am sick. I must die. Lord, have mercy on us. And here's my poem, um, sponsored by Nash. And it's called A Litany in Time of Plague. Brightness falls from the air, Nash's error, or what someone made Nash's error, falls on my ears in the bright afternoon laying waste to autumn, like elected grace, long delayed this early November. The vegetable garden is in seed, pandemics work, and soon no more. Lord, have mercy on us, soon to be no more. The blonde green lawn strokes of snow will blight into darkness, falls, from the air, shining off the executioner's instrument, standing by as proof that all order of song and counter song secures rapture. 
Above all else, a garden can teach you singing and silence the way it taught me America, the bright cloven music with an incumbent or departing grief still totters on the scales of denial. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, fantastic reading, uh, which is still reverberating for me and I'm sure for our audience. Uh, please do feel free to uh, post your questions in the chat box now, but I, I want to maybe uh, open up with a question. Uh, I'm struck by the range of allusion in your work and also the range of vantage points, how, how your poems inhabit different historical moments uh, the kind of whirly gig and slightly terrifying energy of Thomas Nash there in, in your plague poem, and voices in dramatic monologues in your poems. Can you tell us why you're attracted to this transmigration in your work and what dramatic monologue and different voices are doing in your poems? <laughs> hmm. um, thank you, Carl, uh, for that terrific question to start us off on and for your kind words on the reading. Uh, Nash is quite haunting and it's always such a wonderful thing to discover how much poetry poetry is a, is a timeless art. Time and time again we re rediscover that um, when we go back to earlier poets and see how their making has relevance and and energy for our time, giving us language to deal with, you know, especially difficulties that at times we don't have the language to truly uh, confront. Um, so that, that was the case for me and Nash. Uh, but to your question, uh, why I am so drawn to the dramatic monologue? Um, I think, uh, firstly, it must be out of this long uh, sort of um, secret desire, abiding desire of mine to, to write plays. And um, I have written verse dramas, but I've never been too confident with them. And so I have always sort of reworked them into, into poems, uh, standalone poems. Uh, the, the human voice, of course, is the first instrument and growing up around many voices in a in a small place where uh, those voices uh, speak to you uh, or when they don't speak to you but hearing them um, confirms one's own humanity one's own being as as a, as a, as a subject within a world that's active and um, and so I strain to celebrate those voices. I wish to speak back to them um, uh, by inhabiting them. Um, so that's, that's sort of the first sort of reason for my own attraction to uh, the dramatic monologue. It's also interesting to, uh, um, on another scale, that we tend to associate the, the dramatic monologue with the poetry of um, Robert Browning, right? And Browning is often sort of seen as one of the first poets to sort of write psychology into um, modern poetics. Uh, the, the, the modernists sort of inherited this, uh, this, this kind of aesthetic making from Browning. And I'm interested in that, the kind of ways human psychology say so much about, um, I mean, everything that can be said about the human person and, uh, and our humanity and what is exposed from that kind of inhabiting of another voice. So creating a character, whether creating it from uh, experience, experiencing uh, the voice that one encounters uh, uh, around, but or just imagining a voice uh, does something to reveal the consciousness and conscience of uh, our 
human predicament. And I, I see that the dramatic monologue is a, a fantastic way to sort of interrogate such a position. I hope that's uh, sufficient a, a response. Um, yeah, thanks for the question. You know, it's 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 interesting because also I I do not believe I I write quote unquote dramatic monologue or execute it the way in which the form uh, should be executed. So it's not a perfect dramatic monologue. <clears throat> um, it's my own sort of rifting on it. Um, so it's more a ghost of the dramatic monologue than the actual form it's, itself. Thanks for that, Aisha. I'll pass over to my colleague, Catherine Gander. Aisha, thank you so much for that reading. It was it was just magical. I was really just, just swept away by it. And um, I have lots of questions to do with your, your reading and, and my reading of your books, which I, which I have here and, and, and adore. But um, there's one question I'd like to start with, which kind of follows on from, from Carl's, I guess, which is that, you know, one of the things I really love about your poetry in general is, is how it transports, uh, not just sort of back in time or across, you know, um, psychological realms or geographical realms or, or, or oceans or, or, or land masses or even into different literary traditions, which of course it does all of these things. But I think also how in, in that act of transporting the reader, you show how these journeys are a kind of, not just possible, but necessary form of, of, of imagination, of a kind of nomadic imagination. Mm. And I think, um, for me anyway, and especially in the last few years, I have a small child now and I, I kind of see the world differently, or at least I'm sort of transported back in ways that I haven't been for a long time, you know, living with him, especially under sort of lockdown uh, conditions, that there's this kind of magic in your poetry that seems to me resident in this condition of, of childhood where times and places are kind of com conflated or without boundary. And I was wondering um, if you could talk to us a little bit about perhaps your own childhood and how that has influenced your poetry, but also maybe about the kind of a state of childhood or childhood as a state of being and how that might teach us something about poetry or about the world because childhood is a, I think a big part of your poetry if I'm if I'm reading it right. Oh yeah ab absolutely thanks for that terrific question Catherine um, and you know when you have a childhood uh, in in a place like Jamaica um, It's a combination of, of, the, of a, a sense of innocence uh, being protected as a child, but it's very difficult to completely shield a child in such an atmosphere with the kind of history of the, the country, the background of it, uh, from encountering the, 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 the very trauma, the, you know, the trauma of history. It's so exposed and open that I think a Jamaican child uh, grows up very much um, aware of um, the violent past, and it, it's a it's a heavy burden to 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 have and carry as a child. Um, but also at the same time, the the joy of childhood um, is very much part of how a child exists in, in back home. Um, you know, children are beloved and treated uh, generally with just such huge kindness. And that was the case for me. I was um, well taken care of. I had a, a very happy childhood. Um, I used to think I was, uh, uh, you know, a few years ago, I thought maybe I was the only sort of brooding child around my community walking with a notebook and thinking, oh, I have to write about the devastation of what I'm, I'm witnessing. <clears throat> but turned out that I wasn't the only one. There was, you know, most people were, and, you know, trying to engage this, this disparity of being um, from their, with their own kinds of talents. So 
so there's that aspect of it, the, the, the doubleness of childhood, of, of the, the sense of the prevailing violence that there is not language to really quite address it. Um, but it's in the, 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 that moment of childhood uh, that uh, one, mm, you know, think about it, that background most imaginatively, right? And um, at some later stage, once, uh, you know, in my case, uh, you know, being so obsessed with those years of childhood and where I grew up specifically in the rural area uh, of a place called uh, St. Thomas, um, I spent a, a good portion of my childhood there, which is even now, if you visit one of the places where remnants of plantation slavery still exist, uh, the, the cane fields grow there, the sugar factories exist, and so on. So, um, so whenever, I, so, so at some later point when I started to meditate on these things, um, I found returning to childhood memories were, you know, was the major way to give expression and expressive forms to that form of that kind of disturbance. Well, and of course, there's the whole Blakean thing about the one's childhood, that sort of pre-verbal stage of one's life is the most rich in sensation. And also it's, you know, it's, it's the, the child has this deep, um, you know, deeply kind, deeply self-aware of uh, causing harm uh, and not wishing to cause harm. I think that's intrinsic to, to the, the, the child self. And once that's been lost, some, some, I think some element of poetry is trying to retrieve that early innocence, right? But of course, it, it's impossible to, to completely um, restore. And nor is, I think, the poetry project is, in, is interested in restoring it um, to, quote unquote, pure innocence, but wanting to, you know, uh, conflate the pre-lapsarian and post-lapsarian self into, into one. Yeah, yeah, I get that. And I think you do that pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for answering that question. Thanks for that. And is, is it Wordsworth who, who talks about, or Shelley that talks about getting back into that kind of uh, original state of grace uh, in childhood or something? Um, yes, I'm just right. thinking about um, you. You mentioned your, your your childhood in Jamaica, and and you read that beautiful elegy. I'm really glad you did uh, for Claude McKay. And I'm just wondering, do you see yourself writing in uh, a, a Caribbean tradition? That might be how you, you would phrase it, even. But is that something you you are aware of or think of? Uh, and maybe you could say a little bit more about that. Yeah, thank you. Um absolutely see myself as someone forged by uh, a Caribbean tradition. And I'm one of the, f you know, I'm one of, I'm, a luck I'm lucky in this regard. Uh, someone like McKay didn't have a Caribbean tradition to, to draw on, you know. Um, Caribbean poets writing um, from the Caribbean were, were few and far apart. At, uh, at that that stage of the early twentieth century, um, so he he wouldn't have had like what I have and my contemporaries uh, poets who have started to imagine and and write imaginatively about the Caribbean uh, outside of the shadow of uh, of the of the empire of the imperial gaze, right. <clears throat> And so, yes, I do see myself um, strongly writing in, in such a tradition um, that we could say that Claude McKay, in fact, inaugurated the, the modern period of, um, of the Caribbean tradition, or perhaps more safely to say the Jamaican uh, tradition. Um, he published his first book, uh, his first two books uh, when he was quite young in 1912 and what's extraordinary that these books were written in Jamaican dialect and they were pretty popular in Jamaica um, one of which is one the books were called the Song of Jamaica 
and um, consta ballads and um, humorous verses, sort of modeled mostly on your countryman, uh, Robert Burns. Uh, in fact, uh, McKay thought of himself as the Bobby Burns of the Caribbean. And uh, I thought, I think he, he thought he was that good. And to, to an, he, he was, you know, the, this, this, this humorous, but also frighteningly realistic uh, verse uh, that uh, McKay wrote in his early period. But then um, like most Caribbean writers, uh, the generation following him uh, and his own generation moved from the Caribbean to, uh, in McKay's case, America and others uh, to England. So that's also another kind of tradition of Caribbean writing that has to be taken account of in that um, it's, it's, there is a, from the earliest period of the Caribbean writing, a sort of diaspora of Caribbean writing that um, began outside of their home countries. And so in, in McKay's case, I think what I take from it is, is to consider um, America, uh, the U USA, um, just a mainland of the Americas. Um, so the Caribbean is an archipelago of the Americas. Um, so whatever new world poetics that come out of the experience of, of the Americas, um, whether Caribbean, Southern America, or Northern America, is one, is one huge fragmentary roiling uh, poetics. And McKay was uh, in the center of this. So that's the, the kind of Caribbean trajectory or tradition I, I place myself in as a sort of a, um, in the modernist um, experience of McKay, someone who kind of went through a sort of self-dispossession in order to become a better poet. He, he left home and, um, um, you know, because of certain realities, of course, there's no publishing in the Caribbean. McKay's first two books were published in, in the States, I'm sorry, in, in, in the UK. Uh, and then his subsequent works were published in, 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 the, in the States. So that reality drove him to, to, to be away. But I also think it's out of a, a deeper hunger for what is the, the, the experience of the Americas and how does that, um, uh, connect to uh, our Caribbean experience as well. Thank you, Aishan. I I have uh, a lot of <laughs> questions to ask you, but I am very aware that the questions are coming in through our chat box from our um, audience and our students that are in the audience. So I am going to select some of those for mm -hmm. us to answer, if that's all right with you. Um, <laughs> And I think, you know, you've, you've been answering um, uh, Anita's question um, as you, uh, you know, through this discussion, really, because the first question that she had was something about inspiration, sort of where do you find your inspiration? And I also had a question for you about, you know, music and the importance of music in, in your work, both of your, of your published uh, collections, but now, you know, the, the poem that you read of, uh, that is new work also, of course, was called Little Music. So um, I wonder if we could talk about that a bit as part of your inspiration. Um, and then part of Anita's question also had to do with process. What is the process for writing your poetry? Um, and actually, I wonder if, if music has an influence there too. Yeah. Sorry, did you say it was Anita? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you for your question, Anita. Um, these are, you're using words that I, I understand well, and I, you know, being the kind of poet who, I think a poet's immediate direction is to question, uh, each word. So a word like process, I've, I've, um, I, I tend to sometimes have a bit of trouble with, but I, I do understand, and I won't play devil's advocate, uh, with the word itself. Um, so... Um, I would say it's, 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 it, I could de de describe the mechanics of it, which is completely boring and, uh, you know, but most of the times it's not ab about waiting for inspiration. 
I I work um, um I work I just work I sit down and I draft and draft um, I I read a lot I you know steal from places and then rework them into my own and and things like that so it's a it's a heavily drafting process it's, it's I enjoy that uh, quite a lot because I've been doing it so much and um, doing it with an almost rigorous discipline. Um, the waking early to, to make notes uh, and, and so on. At some point in along this process, uh, something, something, something holds and you know it, you, you, you have developed that instinct as a poet to recognize what has promise and where you should break your back on. And um, and that's that's really the most lush part of the the writing when you hit on what has such you know what ha what can what you can lift into a certain momentum and see through. Um, so that's that's what I quite enjoy and uh, and music uh, helps me to concentrate on trying to get to that place where poetry is happening. Um, I don't write to music, nor do I attempt to write music. I, I, I don't think of poetry in, in such a way. It's, it's, they, they have music and poetry. They do intersect and share a lot, but it, it's two different languages. Uh, a poet would wish uh, he or she uh, were just writing music would, would have just been so much simpler to put one's hand in the air and do this and then you have created a poem because that's what music is, uh, sound in the air. But language is a, is a whole other animal. Um, so music can provide a kind of stimulant uh, to you know, get you going, get you grooving. Um, but it, it, in the end, it doesn't necessarily um, make the poem that you're trying to make. I, I, I think, and this probably is the case for just about any, um, I think it's just the case for uh, generally, but given where I grew up and the kind of way that music, um, you know, the ways in which music is a major part of a Jamaican existence, it's just what it is, just, just music. It, it, it just fill the island. Um, I would risk saying that there is a, a, a music language uh, that is specifically Jamaican, but it's more the condition of what that kind, the, the kind of music that come out of Jamaica um, shape, right? Um, it, 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 I wouldn't reduce it too much by trying to describe what that is. But I would say it's a combination of um, celebration because a lot of our popular music in Jamaica uh, sort of came about around the time of emancipation in 1834. The, slave, the African enslaved people uh, made music to celebrate that occasion of um, being free, but they were already making music. So the music during the period of enslavement sort of filtered into the emancipation period and then stretched over to the, the period of independence. So what that says, it's, it's a music that is steeped in freedom, in a free spirit sense of oneself. And that's actually just even how a Jamaican walk into a room as if he owns a damn place um, and so on. So it, 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 it it reminds you the Jamaican music of that um, that that one that we freed ourselves. Uh, I've been having uh, gone through the atrocity of slavery, enslavement, but it's also yeah. So it's also that too that the music is a, is a is a form of uh, memorial um, in and of itself. You're speaking there about those redemption songs, and uh, I have a question from uh, one of my students in my third year poetry seminar group, and it was a question I sort of had myself, which is that I think 
uh, your line that history is dismantled music. You know, it's, it's kind of such a resonant uh, way of thinking about the history of lyric poetry. And uh, my student, Rebecca, asks, do you feel any hesitations when answering the history through your poetry, uh, how the burden of the responsibility of portraying it correctly affects your work? Oh, that's such an amazing question. You have terrific que uh, students, Carl. <clears throat> And um, I, I like it when I'm being kept on my toes. And you are, you know, uh, your question actually speaks to, um, yeah, to that kind of. I think your question is is uh, speaking to uh, responsibility. Um, what is the poet's responsibility? Does the poet have any? Um, and the the short answer is yes I, I i i believe so and and i do of course um um i try to be careful in in generalizing and um answering in a sort of representative way uh i i but also i'm i'm also aware of something else that one being the kind of given given what whatever identities are imposed on me and the ones that I I uh, project myself that uh, I have a role to play um, in that greater emancipation redemption uh, evocation that I can't be selfish uh, as much as so much of the lyric lyric poetry is deeply egomaniac you know it's steeped in a navel gazing uh sense but the best of it erupts out of that um solitude or isolation of of the lyric eye and um is flooded back into a, a communal community um kind of being even uh in in a, in a kind of a, even a kind of in, a, in an activist way. Um, but it's not my starting point though. Uh, and that's honest to my um, upbringing. I was never, uh, you know, recruited to <clears throat> become a symbol of anything or to represent anything but myself. Um, and I, I, I'm, you know, sometimes it's quite touching to think back to those uh, very earliest part of childhood when someone, a stranger, would uh, give me an, an exercise book or a pencil, um, only out of, you know, probably hearing that there's a, a, some kid who likes to to scribble, um, but it those weren't handed to me with the with a, with, with a notion that I should make something um, that um, that, um, that that person should should have any claim to. It's make something for yourself, right? And um, so a, a, a large part of my own identity is bound up with that kind of um, attitude towards work. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's tied to a, a, um, a sense of always paying forward gratitude, with gratitude, uh, what was given to me, even though no one necessarily asked me to, to do so. So that's how I, I am as a, a poet uh, for, uh, in, for the main part. And, and that helps me to tread very carefully um, with regards to, you know, um, representing anyone else but myself. Aishan, thank you. I'm just, that um, was fantastic. I, I, we could talk all night, couldn't we? But it is um, five to 
five here in GMT, and I know that this uh, event is scheduled for one hour. Your last, um, your last answer, I think, did address a number of elements, at least, of the questions in the chat there. There was one, perhaps, that it didn't, which I'll just touch on briefly before we ask you to conclude the event with a, a brief reading, which was, um, just permit me to bring it up again, uh, from Olamide, who says, first, say happy uh, Black History Month. And secondly, the question relates to the role of mentorship in the life of the poet, especially a black writer, and whether you think mentorship is a useful tool while navigating poetry in a place that is predominantly white, brackets, island. Um, do you have any words of advice or experience about mentorship? Um, thanks for the question. I didn't get the name of the person who asked. It's a very important one. Uh, thanks for, for asking it and also happy Black History Month to you as well and happy birthday to Toni Morrison and to Audre Lorde. Yes. Uh, so we have a lot to, to celebrate and, that, and speaking of mentorship, these were two great mentors um, who fostered a whole generation of, of uh, poets of color, writers of colors, uh, um, women, um, underrepresented uh, minorities. I think too of this wonderful phrase by the Spanish poet uh, Juan Jimenez. Uh, he talks about the, the immense minority, right? Um, I feel that's, that's how one has to, to, to think for oneself, that one is immense. Um, the, the idea of, of, of minorities is, uh, you know, it's a serious thing, but it, it's, it's, we can say it's also a socio-historical invention. You know, this is what someone said or made it so. Um, so I have to do the kind of decolonization work uh, for myself uh, to, you know, to not believe it, to first of all, reject all labels. Um, and then I can select the ones that I feel uh, comfortable with. Um, I teach at a, at a university that is a, a very uh, privileged place to be. Um, and, I, and I'm very much aware of that. And I try to, to, to make use of that privilege in the best way possible uh, where mentorship is concerned. Uh, I, I began classes two weeks ago with uh, teaching some poems by Phyllis Wheatley. And we looked at one of her poems, which is an ad it's called an, an Address to the Students of Cambridge. You know, and it's, a, it's an amazing poem in which you have this, uh, this African-American, uh, at that point, one could even say African-American, but this freed black woman addressing the, the white elites, male elites of a, uh, elite institution. And she begins the poem by saying, you know, I am an African. Um, but then there's a very striking phrase uh, later on in the poem where she says, um, you know, um, make use of your privilege, improve on your privilege, right? Um, she says that, and later on, she, it sort of uh, modifies why she says so, or else you're going to go to hell, because uh, a very you know she was a very deeply Christian woman. Um, but I think it's a it's a much more it's it's a, certainly a much more revolutionary statement uh, than just a Christian one. It's, it has I think deep social implications that you have this privilege of whiteness, education, and all the rest of it. You have to do something. Um, and I try to turn the question uh, to uh, those who are more empowered uh, and, um, and can do something to make a difference where mentorship is not only, in this case, um, an interaction that might hopefully improve a student's or someone in, in, engaging uh, directly uh, a poet writing of, of poetry. But what are the conditions that 
can be changed uh, economically. We have to always return to this because um, if we don't have the, the means to sponsor mentorship, then the, the process of mentorship will just go very slowly and um, won't sometimes be realized. So the money have to, <laughs> it might sound a little, I don't know, but, it, but the, 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 the money has to be there and it is there. It, it was made on the backs of um, um, people taken from their, their homes. So uh, this must be the first acknowledgement where, where repatriate, um, not, where emancipation is concerned. It's not a process that uh, um, should be laid at the foot of uh, um, the people who were enslaved, but also those who have benefited um, most significantly from that uh, you know, devastating historical uh, reality. Aishan, thanks very much for such a generous and, and thought-provoking discussion. Um, we've loads of questions, but unfortunately we've run out of time. So I'd like to invite you just to uh, read a final poem to close the site, and then Catherine will, will close the event. And we hope to see you in, in Ireland uh, at some stage in the future. Uh, I would like to, add, thank you. <clears throat> um, so I'll do that terrifying thing again uh, of sharing screen. I can figure it out and then read one last poem. Is it visible, Carl? Yeah, it's visible. Okay, thank you. Uh, so the final poem that I'll read, <clears throat> it's called uh, The Ark by Scratch. Um, Carl asked, asked a question about dramatic monologue, and this is my own take on it. And it's a poem in the voice of uh, Lee Scratch Perry, who is still alive and um, very much active in his late eight, mid or late eighties, but is known to it. You know, was one of the great uh, pioneers of uh, reggae music, and in particular uh, dub music. He was one of um, Bob Marley's mentors, speaking of mentorship. And, you know, what we tend to now think of as the Marley magic, uh, Scratch was important uh, uh, as one of the, the people to help Marley discover that, that you know, that, that, that Marley magic. There's no, know, there's, there's no term for it really. Um, but Scratch famously built a studio in Kingston that he called the Black Ark Studio. And it was a place where not only recording of music happened, but all kinds of different art making at the same time. I think of it as this sort of vast archive, this, in, this place of inventory of um, you know, the Black Atlantic experience. But one day, Scratch, uh, sort of this, he just burnt the studio down. No one knows why. Um, so the destruction of the Ark is one of those great mysteries in Jamaica. <clears throat> but instead of the destruction, I wanted to imagine in this poem, uh, the building of the Ark. Okay, <clears throat> the Ark by Scratch. The genie says, build a studio. I build a studio from ash. I make it out of peril and slum things. I alone when blood and bullet and all Christ fucking American dollar politicians start the pressure down to nothing. When the equator is confused and coke bubbles on tin foil to cemented wreath, I built it. A conga drum so hollowed through the future pyramids up long before CDs spin away roots men knocking down by the seaside like captives wheeling by the Keba River. The genie says, build a studio, but don't take any foul in it, just electric. So I make it. My echo chamber with shock rooms of rainbow King Arthur's sword keep in. 
and one for the Maccabees alone. For covenant is bond between man and worm. Next room is Stone Age, after that iron. And one I name Freeze, for too much ice downtown in the brains of all them crossing Duke Street, holy like Parsons. And in the seat, and in the circuit breaker, the red switches for death, and the black switches for death, and the master switches black and red. So if US, Russia, China, Israel talk, missiles talk, I talk that switch I call Melchizedek. I build a closet for the waterfalls, one for the rivers, another for oceans, next for secrets. The genie says, build a studio. I built it without go for wood. Now, consider the nest of bees in the cranium of the gong. Consider the nest of wasps in the heart of the bush doctor. Consider the nest of locusts in the gut of the black heart man. I put them there and the others that vibrate at the feast of the Passover when the collie weed is passed over the roast fish and cornbread. I upset her. I jangle on the black wax, the super ape, E.T. I cleared the wave. Again, consider the burning bush in the ears of Kalanji and the burning sword in the mouth of the fireman and the burning pillar in the eyes of the Gargamel. I put them there to outlast Earth as I navigate on one of Saturn's rings. I might a solid shadow setting fire to snow in my ark. I credit not the genie, but the coral rock. I am an am stone. I am perfect. Myself is a vanishing conch shell speeding around a discotheque. At the embassy of angels, skeletons ramble to check out my creation dub. And sex is dub, stripped to the bone. And dub is the heart breaking the torso, the spring olive beet to be eaten up by sunlight. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much. I love that poem. <laughs> and it's a wonderful one to conclude the event. Oh, thank you. I'm very grateful. <laughs> thank you, Ketra. <clears throat> Um, yeah, well, as Carl says, it just remains for me to conclude the event uh, by thanking you again, Aishin, for spending time with us and sharing your words and your wisdom. Um, thank you to the audience members, of course, for joining us and sparking such uh, a really fascinating conversation that I think we will continue on for, um, for, for, for many weeks to come in our, in our classes and beyond. Our next event in the Poetry and Poetics series will be on Thursday, the 11th of March, which is the same time at 4 till 5 GMT with a very special guest, Vani Capaldeo. So we look forward to seeing you there. But now let me speak for everyone here uh, and express our gratitude and huge appreciation to the brilliant Aishan Hutchinson. Thank you. <laughs> Aishan, I wish we could all have a massive round of applause, but I'm pretty sure everyone is <clears throat> saluting <throat> you from their, from their homes. So thank you very much and have a good evening. <laughs>